Today what we're going to cover, um, our main point obviously is the antimicrobials in the mouth, uh, what ones to use, what ones not to use. But uh, in the beginning I'd like to briefly talk about veterinary dentistry and its growth around the world and hopefully it's growing faster in Italy than it is in the United States. Um, to understand which antibiotics to choose, we're going to go through an oral exam and understand periodontology. So we're going to start from the basic level where I always do every case in my practice. I do the basics first and then I go up and I'm going to show you what we do there. Uh, then at the end, we're going to talk about some cases, some stomatitis cases in dogs that respond to antimicrobials and also some stomatitis cases in cats that respond to laser and antimicrobials both. One thing uh, you'll find, I'm going to beat up uh, veterinarians in uh, my home country because we overlook dentistry all the time. And unfortunately, we're not educated in dentistry in our country. Uh, out of the uh, 27, soon to be 28 veterinary schools, there's only four veterinary schools that teach any dentistry. And so uh, most schools, 23 to 24, they get the same amount of uh, dentistry that I got when I was in vet school. Zero. Nothing. So I had to learn after I got out. Uh, the other point that we want to make is the general health of an animal is just like the general health of everyone here. If our teeth are badly infected, then we have other problems with our health. And we'll show some slides for human dentistry that will confirm that. And as science evolves in this area, we'll learn even more the importance of oral health. This is from uh, a US DVM news magazine, and it covers the year uh, 2000. And in order of uh, preference, these are the areas that are going to expand or are expanding in the US, dentistry being number one. And as you see uh, down the road, of course, with me, cardiology is not so good. And in the US, two out of three veterinarians say that they're doing more procedures. They don't say how many more procedures. Very few are doing less in that same time period. But the interesting to, uh, thing to note, uh, it will come up during the course of this lecture, that the dentistry cases that we see, that is the most common problem of the pets that come into our practice. It may be the most common problem, but in the United States, it encompasses only 2% of the total practice income. So that's a huge disparity. The most common problem, obviously, is not being taken care of. This is a study uh, the Mark Morris Institute did uh, through the University of Minnesota. It's probably about three years old now, I think. Whoop, 95. Um, and as you can see, these is for cats. And if you clump all these together uh, from the age range to zero, and I don't see too many 25-year-old cats in my practice, but um, dental disease is the number one problem. There's one problem with this study is they didn't do full mouth x-rays. And uh, full mouth x-rays are one of the most important things that we can do in our practices because when we do them, half the time we find a problem in the mouth that needs to be addressed. Because without x-rays, we only see 30% of the tooth. So we're guessing 70% of the time when we do dentistry without x-rays. And they did an excellent study at uh, University of California, Davis, that shows that in about 300 dog and cat cases, 50% of the time, there were problems that needed to be taken care of that would have been totally missed without x-rays. In dogs, you'll see a similar type spread. So if you add them all up, basically oral disease is number one. Again, remember there are no full mouth x-rays here or those dental percentages would be uh, significantly higher. In our practice, uh, a complete oral exam, uh, when I'm in the exam room and I'm looking at a dog or a cat's mouth, I do very little examination of the mouth in the exam room. Uh, if you start wrestling with the pet, the client's uncomfortable, the pet's uncomfortable, and I really can't see that much. So in our practice, we actually have three veterinarians that do only dentistry. A complete oral exam starts out with anesthesia. And uh, we take anesthesia very serious in our practice, and we're going to cover how we do that. 
with monitors and IV fluids uh, further on in the lecture. And it's obvious what we're looking for. We're looking uh, at the gums for any infection, obviously recession of the gums, tumors. In the mucous membranes, ulcerations are something to look for because that's a, a definite indication for antibiotics. And we don't think about that that often, but I'll show you a case of uh, kissing ulcers as we come down uh, later on in the lecture. Obviously, we look for bleeding, and as we go through this, you'll find out that we use a periodontal chart, so we record every tooth just like a dentist does in their practice or a periodontist. And there are num numerous things that we look for. Make sure to look uh, the roof of the mouth because we can find tumors there and other problems. And then obviously the tongue and looking under the tongue because, again, tumors will find under the tongue that uh, if you don't look, you don't find. Um, I actually added another line onto this, but uh, it's stuck in my laptop in my room, so I didn't make it right here. The oral exam, we do a periodontal chart. It's actually a full page. And since you're all busy just like we are, we actually make little checkoffs, so it's a lot easier than the human dentist version. Um, that way we can record it. We have a copy that we give to the client. In our practice, we have a third copy that we give to uh, other veterinarians. Uh, but the one that I don't have on here is, again, full mouth x-rays. And you'll hear me bring that up time after time because it's so important. Without full mouth x-rays, it's really not a complete exam. You're missing 70% of the mouth. The uh, probes are very important to use. Um, obviously, in cats, a very tiny pocket means something. In dogs, it needs to be two millimeters or more to mean something. I actually uh, use a plastic probe instead of the metal probes, because those of you who have had your mouths probed with a metal probe, it feels like a pin, at least to me, when they stick it in your teeth. So I try to be as uh, compassionate for the pets as I would want for myself. I'm going to give you just three quick slides on anatomy so we can understand where the infection is and what we're looking for. Uh, and this slide right here also shows you, again, if we don't take an x-ray of this tooth, then the most important part we miss. Obviously, this is all we can see. So you can see a, a vast majority of the tooth is missed without x-rays. Uh, and for definition's sake, this area right here is called a furcation or a furca, and this area over here. And in human teeth, if you have an infection in these areas, typically, no matter what they do, in three months, the person loses that tooth. It'll actually uh, have to be extracted within three months. But in dogs, more so than cats, we don't see that many of these lesions in cats. But in dogs, we can probably save these teeth for a long period of time, up to 90% of the time with the proper therapy. And one of the things we'll want to do on these, besides the right antibiotic therapy, is make sure we do ultrasonic scaling right in that area, if indeed it's involved. This just covers uh, basically the hard portion of the tooth. The enamel obviously is a white area, and we would think that the dog enamel would be much thicker than our enamel, but it's not. Human enamel is thicker than in dogs. Uh, the dentin, of course, is this area, and the dentinal tubules are horizontal, and that's one area where infection can remain in a tooth, and that's why systemic antibiotics are very helpful, because if you don't eradicate the uh, bacteria in the dentinal tubules, then uh, you're going to have a, a focus of infection that does not go away and it keeps seeding the mouth. Then obviously the pulp cavity is the artery vein and nerves. The periodontium is basically what holds the tooth into the oral cavity. And uh, it's comprised obviously of the gingiva, the periodontal ligament, and then the cementum. And one thing to note when we do hand scaling or with curettes, if you curette down in here, if there's a deep pocket, basically with four strokes of the curette, you effectively remove all of the cementum. And since you can see cementum is the layer that periodontal ligament grows out of, when you actually do hand scaling, you're taking away all the cementum and you're slowing down the healing process for up to eight weeks. And in human beings, that can actually cause pain for up to eight weeks. And I had a case uh, once from Santa Barbara, California, a little Maltese, that the clients called me weekly for about eight weeks and complained about the pain. Uh, so in 
human dentistry in the United States and also in veterinary dentistry, we're going more to ultrasonics. And then, of course, the alveolar bone is what, uh, what holds it, is the hard structure that holds the tooth in, and we'll go into that in just a bit. Uh, simply stated, gingivitis, that's the easiest thing to take care of. You do not need antibiotics for gingivitis. In fact, I did a three-year study for Upjohn that just proved we knew it before we did it, but it showed that antibiotics aren't necessary. All you have to do is remove the plaque, remove the calculus, and the gingivitis heals, and it goes back to normal. The cause of gingivitis, uh, it's very interesting, in periodontal disease, even up until 1950, uh, the periodontists, human periodontists, didn't know what the cause was. Eventually, they figured out it was bacteria, uh, but there's a study now at the University of Southern California that shows in humans, and I'm sure it happens in cats, that herpes virus is a common cause that starts out gingivitis and periodontal disease, and obviously bacteria can invade, and then we end up with periodontitis. This is uh, aspen trees. I actually live in uh, the Black Hills in South Dakota, and I have a short commute to my job in Los Angeles, about 1,100 miles. Periodontitis, as you can see, this is a destruction of the periodontium that holds the tooth in place. And that really is what our focus of attack is uh, when we're using antimicrobials. And uh, the bone loss actually, we think the bacteria actually do something directly to the bone, but it's an indirect response. So the inflammation causes the loss of the bone. And there are some new uh, drugs coming out. I'm sure you're familiar with Rimadil from Pfizer, correct? Yes? Maybe not. Um, there's a new COX-2 inhibitor that Novartis out of Switzerland is coming out with that we may use in human dentistry and also with uh, dogs, and then hopefully it'll be approved in cats, that we would actually use an anti-inflammatory in conjunction with an antibiotic. Not a cortisone, but a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. And in uh, Periodontists, they've long called it, as you can see, the silent killer in humans because it's like a bacterial infection that without treatment, it never goes away. So think of it as a bad cold that gets worse and you have it for two, three years. It's always wearing down the body. This is a case that will show you in the mouth, typically you have varying degrees of periodontitis, anywhere from a normal tooth to a really bad tooth, maybe even tooth loss, all in one mouth. Uh, this is a wolf, actually, that I did three root canals on. It was in the movie uh, Dancing with Wolves. So it's a big mouth. But as you can see, right here would be a normal tooth. We have like a grade two perio here. Uh, and that's typical. There's always different levels. This is how he came to me. And he actually, uh, when I was in my office, he walked by and he had a big log chain around his neck. And I'm supposed to be the brave veterinarian, but I was kind of like scared. And uh, we have three exam rooms in our practice, and there's one that's really tiny, and my receptionist must not like me because they put the wolf in the tiniest room. And as soon as I walked into the room, he put his paws up on the table like this, and he was so big, he looked me right in the eye. And I'm trying to be brave, thinking about my career, and I'm talking to the uh, trainer who has the log chain in her hand. And the next thing I know, I looked away, and my hand, my right hand, and I'm right-handed, is in the wolf's mouth. And I'm thinking career, maybe, I don't know. And uh, fortunately, uh, she said the wolf was nibbling me to see if I was OK. It was, must have been a pass-fail basis. And I passed because I still have my hand. But he came in uh, two other times because we ended up, as I said, uh, doing three root canals on the wolf. And they're so smart. I mean, he just glanced at me the next time. And he knew who I was, and everything was fine. He didn't have to chew my hand off or anything. Um, this is one of the few times I use this combination of ACE torbugesic. I talked to my uh, friendly anesthesiologist at Ohio State, Bill Muir. And uh, typically in the US, if we use ACE promazine in a canine, we dilute it down 10 times, so a very small amount. But in a wolf, we kind of go the other way. And it did slow him down. He also, I forgot to say, there was also in that movie, I don't know if you noticed it, because I'm sure some of you saw that movie, there was a stand-in wolf. So there are actually two wolves in there, but the socks on two socks were, uh, were different on the other wolf. And the other wolf only needed two root canals. Um, periodontist, the way it actually uh, progresses, 
There's plaque accumulation, and plaque is bacteria and biofilms, which in the second hour we'll go over that significantly. Uh, so it's a combination of sticky bacteria, if you will, in the mouth. And then they typically will migrate towards the base of the tooth. And as you can see, you have gum loss, periodontal ligament loss. And then as you get down here, we start to have bone resorption. Then eventually, with, um, with no treatment, obviously the tooth becomes mobile. And then there's tooth loss. And in the United States, we have a terrible tradition about tooth mobility. As I said earlier, most of us got no education at all about dentistry. But through the grapevine or through tradition, we heard that if a tooth is loose, then you pull that tooth. And by pulling that tooth, obviously, the end is over, or if the tooth is dead once you pull it out. However, that's 50% bone loss is all you need to have slight mobility in a tooth. And if you will take a huge amount of bone loss, up to 90%, with the right antibiotics, you can save 90% of those teeth. And we'll show you that as we go along. OK, this is a really severe case here. As you can see, there's a large buildup of calculus. Uh, the little white sticky stuff is the plaque. Um, and these are bacterial biofilms. Again, I'll give you a full explanation uh, next hour. And what happens is, typically, it's a gram-positive bacteria colony in a normal mouth. But as this disease progresses, then it becomes gram-negative, and then eventually gram-negative anaerobes. And the gram-negative anaerobes are the ones that basically go deep and cause the bone loss, secondary to the inflammation. Obviously, with inflammation, there's pain, and then there's increased risk of infection elsewhere in the body. So we see it only in the mouth, but uh, as I'll show you with some slides, there's a lot more that goes on than meets the eye. This is always my uh, interesting slide for me every time I see it, that periodontitis, it's the most common microbial or infectious disease in the world. And in third world countries where they share water wells, all the people will and if they're sick, then they end up with periodontal disease. And also, it's the most common cause of aspiration pneumonia in humans in the U.S. and certainly hospitalized patients. Um, I went through this two years ago. My own mother ended up with uh, aspiration pneumonia because uh, she has bad periodontal disease, so I can't take care of her teeth, though. And in human beings, there are some studies showing uh, increased re risk of stroke coronary heart disease, and there are other problems, lung infections, too, that are associated with this. And as you can see, Steve Offenbacher uh, at uh, University of North Carolina, they've shown twice as likely to have a fatal heart attack if you have periodontal disease, three times as likely to have stroke. Um, so it's, it's very important that we have periodontal health not only in us, but in our uh, dog and cat patients. And in the U.S., at Harvard, we can kind of understand the tradition we have in the U.S. for veterinarians with physicians. As you can see, they only get two hours of education in their whole medical school. And so physicians in the U.S., they don't pay much attention to periodontal disease. And Dr. Ford, this afternoon, he'll be talking about a lung infection that you get secondary to tooth cleanings a few days afterwards in human beings. And that's all because of these infections. Um, in the UK, it's required that you teach veterinary dentistry in all the veterinary schools, so they're, they're way ahead of uh, us in the US. Uh, but it's, uh, like I say, very important for the overall health. Question? Okay, as I said earlier, we're going to talk about root planing versus hand scaling, and you can see the difference with hand instruments. Basically, you will remove 10 times more of the cementum. And so what we do um, in our practice, we do pretty much exclusive ultrasonic scaling. And in fact, in some of the human dental hygiene schools in the eastern part of the U.S., they don't teach hand scaling anymore. They just use ultrasonics. We may go back with a probe if we find a little bit of calculus and use hand scaling. Uh, to remove that, but we're very careful so we don't uh, remove as much cementum. And the sonic uh, machines uh, are much cheaper than ultrasonics, but they have a tendency to break down, so it's, uh, they're not a very good machine. And they also create more heat, which is not good. 
I'm going to go through what we do uh, with a dog or a cat with periodontal disease just step by step and then we're going to move on into the uh, antibiotic therapy. Uh, as we said earlier, the complete oral exam, they're anesthetized and in our practice, um, before we anesthetize them, we always will do blood work the day of and we use propofol and I'm sure, how many are familiar with propofol in the group? Familiar? Oh good, that's great. I love that drug. We've been using it exclusively for about eight years. <clears throat> and uh, we monitor CO2 monitors, O2 monitors, cardiac monitors, and we never give the client a choice. You know, it's, we don't say, would you like your pet to be monitored under anesthesia? It's obvious that we're going to do that. And we also charge for that. Uh, but of all the monitors that I've used, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the CO2 monitor is the best because we can see changes, excuse me, We can see changes with a CO2 monitor about four minutes before you ever see a change on a cardiac monitor. Uh, in the U.S., pulse oximetry, or O2, is more commonly used. However, all these pets are on 100% oxygen, so the O2 really doesn't tell us that much. <coughs> the CO2 is the key. And we always use IV fluids um, with catheters on all our cases. And what I tell my clients is in the U.S., actually, the quality that we use of anesthesia for the pet is actually better than many of our human health organizations in the United States because they don't cover propofol and they don't do as much monitoring, which is kind of sad, but uh, I guess it's good if you're a dog or a cat. Uh, the next thing we do is full mouth x-rays, and then obviously we're going to uh, scale, and then uh, we'll use either local or systemic antibiotics. And when we use systemic antibiotics, if indeed they're indicated, and I'll go into the cases when and why they're indicated, you want to give them one to two hours ahead of time. If you give them after you're done cleaning the teeth or later in the day, you're almost better off not giving the antibiotics. And so uh, we have everything ready in advance, so when they're anesthetized, we can be uh, organized and flow right through it. Uh, IV catheter, as we said, hook up the monitors. And in our practice, um, we take Polaroid pictures before and after. And uh, that really is important with our client relations because every case that we see, even if it's not a dental case, when that pet goes home, we meet with the client in the exam room. And we'll show them the before pictures and then we show them the after pictures. And what I've learned is that without pictures, if I go into the exam room and explain what I did, it just goes over their head. They don't understand it. But if I went in the exam room and just showed a before and an after picture and didn't say anything, then they get it. And what happens is the client understands what you do. We also put the x-rays in there. And uh, that creates value so that when we give them a big fat bill, they don't yell at our receptionists and our receptionists are happy. <coughs> we also uh, will spray the oral cavity with chlorhexidine. And we do that before, during, and after because it protects um, myself when I'm cleaning the teeth and it protects uh, the pet. It will kill about 98% of the bacteria that are actually in the mouth, obviously not below the gums, but the ones that you're going to loosen up, it'll kill those bacteria. <coughs> it also makes your job smell a lot better when you're doing it. Uh, full mouth x-rays on the side up and then we'll ultrasonic scale and root planing means going deeper below the gum line. And we use uh, what are called thin tip ultrasonics in uh, the U.S. And I'm sure you have them available here and they work really well deep below the gum line. And then we'll polish the teeth uh, when we're done. Then, it, <clears throat> as I said earlier, the periodontal charting is very important um, so that we can follow the progress of the case and so the next time the pet comes in we can look back and say, okay, how bad was this tooth? If it's a three millimeter pocket, is it still a three millimeter pocket or is it a two millimeter? Which way are we going? And when you uh, roll them over, make sure to unhook the tracheal tube because we see a fair number of ruptured tracheas and uh, especially in kitty cats, then they blow up like a big Rice Krispie. Um, so we always unhook it before we roll them over. And another uh, study they did in the U.S. was um, when you inflate the trach tube, at least in a cat, you never use more than three millimeters of air 
because if you use more than that, you can actually rupture the trachea. So that's just a little tip, only three millimeters of air. After we're done, we'll uh, look at the x-rays, figure out what's wrong. Um, the x-rays are really easy to read, as I said earlier in the exam room when we let the client look at the x-rays. They are non-contrast or um, non-density films, so you can see the difference is real easy. The, the lesions show up, and when I started out reading x-rays in 1987, dental x-rays, I'd never seen one before, so I had nothing to go on. But what we found is the clients can actually tell what's wrong on the x-rays, and that's the first time they ever see an x-ray. So don't be worried about reading dental x-rays because they're actually very easy. Uh, if we have any dentin exposed, we use a sealant on that. We acid etch it uh, for like 15 seconds, and then we put a clear sealant on there. You can either light cure it or you have a, a chemical cure, so you don't need any equipment. In the U.S., it costs about $30, and you can do about 1,000 teeth for $30. And these are the same sealants that they put on um, children when their molars come in at the age of six and at the age of eight, and that totally prevents cavities. And dentin itself, uh, if it's exposed, they feel hot and cold pain just like we do. And also, if the dentin is exposed, the dentinal tubules are open so bacteria can go into that tooth and possibly creating the need for uh, uh, root canal or antibiotic therapy. So. We do that, and in the U.S., we charge like $30 a tooth. So if you pay $30 for one kit that does 1,000 teeth, you get it paid for in the first tooth. If we have just one simple pocket <coughs> in the mouth, then we uh, oftentimes will use doxorobe gel, and that's a synthetic tetracycline. Uh, it used to be called periosutic. Um, are you fami familiar with it here? Do you use this? I haven't seen it. Upjohn Company bought periosutic gel. And it's kind of difficult to use sometimes because when you put it in the pocket, it doesn't want to stay in there. Uh, but it works well if indeed it stays in. And then in our practice, we do uh, root canals uh, often. This is that same case earlier showing you all the plaque and the calculus to show you before and what it looks like afterwards. And as you can see, if you have a Polaroid of that before and after, then that's really dramatic to the client. For those of us who do this all day long, it really doesn't mean much to us. But if you show that and it's their own pet that they love, then uh, they understand a lot better. This is uh, our little uh, spot in uh, northern Minnesota. Our family inherited this 100 years ago, and we pay about $100 a year to use this. So it's my, my kind of fee. Okay, as we said earlier, if a pocket <coughs> is really deep, uh, we'll use the gel if it's a single pocket. Uh, if there are more than one pockets and we suspect infection elsewhere in the mouth, then we use uh, systemic antibiotics. And uh, we need to use the ones that are most effective against the gram-negative anaerobes. And the theory behind this is, again, the gram-positive bacteria in the mouth are normal. And if we use a drug like Clavamox, it kills all the gram-positives. And then all of a sudden, your balance is upset. And when you get rid of the gram-positives, that allows gram-negatives to multiply more quickly. So if you use the wrong antibiotic in the mouth, you can actually make uh, the infection worse. And I see that with uh, Clavamox uh, commonly. Uh, basically, if we look at all the antibiotics, and we're going to go through the most common ones we use in the U.S., um, clindamycin, as far as choosing one single-dose antibiotic, is one of the best ones. Uh, the negative part of it is it doesn't get all of the gram negatives. So sometimes you're going to hit and miss with clindamycin, and clindamycin probably gets more gram positives uh, than this combination here. And uh, we use uh, this combo for only eight days. <coughs> And together, they are uh, actually very powerful. And it's nice that you give it only once a day because it increases the chances that your clients are actually going to give the drug to the dog, as opposed to two times a day or three times a day. And in veterinary medicine, there's only been one study published on compliance. Uh, and that was in Australia, I think, in like 1996. 
So we really don't know when we prescribe medication to go home to our veterinary patients, we really have no idea where that medication ends up. And we know that in human beings, the studies show that oftentimes the medication isn't even given, not given properly or just sporadically, or they all use half of it and save the rest. So that's uh, kind of sad, there's only one study, but I like this combo because again, it's once, once a day. Toothbrushing um, is something that we didn't think we could get our clients to do, but it's so important. Uh, if we do not have the clients brush the dog's teeth, then what I explain to them is a lot of what I've just done is not going to work. Because if you don't brush the teeth, then within seven days, there's 100% of the plaque bacteria at their back. Now obviously there's some, uh, some dogs that you uh, can't brush. And uh, in Southern California, we call those little dogs land sharks because they'd sooner chew you than uh, look at you. And with those, we'll use TD because that uh, seems to work fairly well. But I'm surprised the majority of our clients who uh, want to have good therapy done for their uh, pet's mouth, specifically dogs, they will brush their teeth. And a fair number of them actually use an ultrasonic toothbrush, an electric toothbrush, and that always surprises me. Now in cats, that's a whole different story. I would say less than 1% of clients will brush their cat's teeth. But we do have clients that will brush their cat's teeth. The key is brushing once a day because if you say brush three times a week, then we know a client's only going to brush once or twice a week. And then when you spread that out more than three days, that's when you start to get plaque recurring. So I always tell them brush daily because I know they'll probably cheat and miss one or two days a week, but that's okay. So make sure you tell them if they're going to do it, brush once a day. Um, we don't have any good uh, dog or cat toothbrushes in the United States. Uh, we have companies that sell them but none of them work that well, so typically I just have them use a uh, soft human toothbrush. And then just to help them out, I, I usually have them put them on a table because then the pet's kind of nervous a little bit and they'll be less apt to fight the client when they brush their teeth. And instead of opening the mouth, I just have them pull back the cheeks and that way they can get the brush in. They only need to do the outside of the uppers and the outside of the lowers. There's really no need to go on the inside. That way it makes it easy. And uh, as you can see, brushing will eliminate 99% of the bacteria, and obviously the toxins that are given off uh, gets rid of that also. Uh, the negative is a brush only penetrates 0.9 millimeters below gum line. So if you have any type of a pocket, then you're not going to penetrate. The Sonicare toothbrush I talked about earlier uh, actually penetrates 4 millimeters, and so it's much better. We always will have these cases come back in 30 days. We want to make sure that they're doing OK. Um, when we're doing uh, research on these, actually, we will do a, uh, a culture and sensitivity we send into the dental school. Uh, there's two negatives about that. Uh, one is cost. It's like $120 US. And the other is it takes two weeks for the lab to grow these anaerobic cultures out. Uh, they do give us some good information. They give us uh, qualitative and quantitative information. The flip side is if <clears throat> I send in a dental um, culture to our animal lab, then I n almost never get a growth. I mean, like, never. So that's kind of a waste of the client's money, at least, uh, well, at least with our labs. And then each case, it'll depend whether you want to see them back in three months or six months. We'll see them back maybe in three months. If they're doing OK and the client's brushing their teeth, then we'll schedule it six months later. And it's amazing how well uh, dogs respond to having their teeth brushed. Okay, um, before we uh, go to the break, we're going to discuss, uh, we'll just go through biofilms. Um, and then when we come back from the break, we may get a little bit into antibiotics and we'll have uh, cases. And I apologize for not having any cases yet because I know when you're back there looking at word slides the whole time, at least for me, it starts to put me to sleep. Uh, but we haven't anybody sleep yet, so that's a good sign. Uh, but when we get to the cases, then uh, it'll be much more interesting, I'm sure. Uh, biofilms, you can see, they've just started studying them just in the early 1990s. 
and they probably have more meaning in the, dent in the oral cavity than they do in other parts of the body. Um, I don't know the Italian word for uh, slime, but uh, I'm sure there's got to be some counterpart. Uh, I first heard about these uh, basically in 1996 at a meeting with Upjohn in Michigan, and biofilms uh, really change how we think about bacteria. I think when we go through veterinary school, we think of bacteria as being one little bug. And what we found is it's not just one little bug. Uh, biofilms, um, you can see they're mostly uh, slimy stuff, but 15% of them are bacteria. And if you'll note, almost all of the world's bacteria actually are in biofilms. <coughs> and biofilms create a lot of problems for antibiotics, and especially in the mouth. Uh, as you can see, they adhere to the surfaces, and the, it's almost like a fortress or a city. That's what the bacteria are with a lot of defense mechanisms. So uh, antibi antibiotics alone typically cannot break through a biofilm. So that's why if you don't clean teeth and you have a lot of plaque and a lot of calculus and you put them on antibiotics, you're basically doing nothing. With all their defense mechanisms, as you can see, um, antibiotics, and disinfectants, even chlorhexidine, even straight bleach does not penetrate biofilms. So our immune system, we don't have the effect of our immune system, and obviously we have IV catheters or other implants in the body. Uh, if you have biofilms attached to them, then that creates a big problem. And unfortunately, dental plaque is probably one of the biggest biofilms that we have in the body. And what they're made up of is a pellicle, as you can see, salivary proteins. And then the plaque itself, as we said earlier, is a mass of bacteria. Uh, there's mucopolysaccharides, and that's the stickiness or the slime that holds them together and holds them in the mouth, not just on the teeth, but the roof of the mouth, the tongue, uh, wherever. And then as it mineralizes, then that's the brown uh, calculus that we have to chip off the teeth. So as you can see, calculus has all of the above in it, and that's why it's important to get rid of calculus. Uh, but our main, um, our main focus, obviously, in dentistry and uh, infection is uh, not only eradicating the plaque, but preventing it. And that's why the TD and the uh, toothbrushes are uh, very important. Uh, Roy Page, he's kind of one of the fathers of periodontists in, the, in America, and uh, he showed a study that I, in a, just a typical periodontal disease, I mean, the, the slime would cover the back of my hand, and all that is in your mouth. And so the number of bacteria is impressive, but also in dogs, cats, and people, there's probably up to 600 species, different species of bacteria in your mouth. Out of 600 species, there may be only six of them that are gram-negative anaerobes that are the ones that we try to attack. We have pretty much named those in people, but we're still kind of in search of which ones do we see in dogs and cats that create problems, because those are the ones we really have to focus on. Uh, the key point here is, without mechanical disruption, the antibiotics probably don't work. And as you can see, you have to have a dosage of antibiotics about a thousand times normal, and if you do that, obviously you're going to have side effects from the antibiotic. So antibiotics alone in periodontal disease and in many infections in the body does not do the job. You can see uh, it makes you think differently about bacteria when you find out how complex they are, not just one little single um, antibiotic or uh, one little single bug. They're just millions and millions of bugs stuck together. So the key with mechanical disruption is we get back to ultrasonic scaling or hand scaling or in uh, I do in cats, I do a lot of CO2 laser, and that just vaporizes, it basically boils away the bacteria and kills the bacteria. So the biofilms are uh, an interesting concept that will help us understand it. In fact, in, um, and when we go to our human dentists and the, the lines, like say in the air drill with the water coming through there, if you flush straight bleach through there, because of biofilms, it doesn't kill all the bacteria in there. And they found in the United States, you can actually have the uh, bacteria that causes Legionnaire's disease can actually live in those lines. 
and you can't get rid of it. And so at least in the US now, I don't know about Italy, those lines actually have to be replaced for each patient so that you don't pass the bacterial infections along from one patient to the next. These are uh, the Grand Tetons in uh, Wyoming, which is about uh, an eight hour drive west of where I live. My mountains aren't that big and they aren't that beautiful. Okay, I'm just going to do a little bit about the infection rates in humans and then it'll probably be, we'll take a little bit earlier break because I think they're already breaking on the other group. Uh, but in a clean wound, if we, if we cut our hand, we have a very small chance of infection. So when we were little kids and our mothers put something on there that stung like heck and we screamed and we cried, it wasn't necessary and it also delayed the healing of that wound. A contaminated wound, as you can see, much higher percentage of infection and in the mouth with those 600 species, you have one third of the time you're getting an infection. Uh, this is from a uh, study at the dental school um, in Los Angeles, UCLA. So antibiotics. As we said earlier, if we're doing a periodontal case, if you give them one to two hours in advance, then you're staying ahead of the bacteria. And when you do that, then it's just like cutting a clean wound. You have a very small chance of infection. But as you can see, as time goes on, the chance of infection, grow, it grows significantly. And in my early practice days, I used to clean a dog's teeth in the morning and then send home antibiotics in the afternoon. And so I was better off not using the antibiotics at all. And it's similar to uh, what you do if gastrointestinal surgery. If you give the antibiotic one time before the surgery, half, the other half during the surgery, and then you send no antibiotics home. So the key is get the antibiotics there before the bacteria stick and before the uh, infection starts. And if you do that, you're way ahead of the game. This is uh, actually in humans. Um, but when we extract teeth or with surgery or uh, just cleaning teeth, you can see that, that we're really kicking a lot of bacteria loose. And that's one of the things that Dr. Ford will talk about in his respiratory lecture this afternoon is kicking bacteria loose and ending up, at least in his lecture, with lung infections. <clears throat> As you saw earlier, it can affect with stroke, uh, can affect the heart, a number of different areas. And it's interesting to note when we uh, go to lunch, when we chew our food, that we're actually kicking bacteria into our bloodstream. And because of biofilms, if you have periodontal disease and you're going to go to your periodontist, or if you have a dog or a cat coming in with periodontal disease, if you put yourself <coughs> on antibiotics or that dog or the cat for a week ahead of time, it does nothing to the levels of bacteria in the bloodstream. Nothing. And again, the reason for that is biofilms. And so there's no need to give antibiotics several days in advance. It really doesn't do anything. It may reduce the inflammation in the gums a little bit, but it doesn't really do anything to the bacterial load. So again, if you're going to use them, give them one to two hours in advance. Timing uh, is everything. OK, we're going to talk now. The meat is subject, antimicrobials, which ones to use, how to choose them. And I promise I'm going to slow down. <laughs> Um, be careful when you use antibiotics. There's a lot of discussion in the U.S. about not using them at all versus using them too much versus using the right antibiotics. As I said earlier, in certain cases, if you choose the wrong antibiotic, you actually can make the infection in the mouth worse. And uh, I snuck over and listened to the last 10 minutes of Dr. Erke's dermatology lecture. And uh, he was saying negative things about Clavamox uh, because he doesn't feel it works well enough in the skin. So if any of you work for Pfizer company, then I will have to ask you to leave before I talk more about Clavamox. Uh, resistance is a problem that we, are, as veterinarians, uh, we get accused of overusing antibiotics and crossover into human medicine. Uh, the antibiotics that we'll use in the mouth, uh, basically we have seen very little resistance. Question? Okay, the indications 
for when we use antibiotics in dentistry. Obviously, if you have a very sick dog or cat uh, with a systemic disease such as diabetes or Cushing's disease, um, if they're immunosuppressed, then you would want them. A uh, very common question we get is, can you do surgery, like say, can you spay a dog and clean their teeth at the same time? If they have gingivitis, yes, you can do it, and you can do it without antibiotics. But if they have periodontal disease, you should use antibiotics, and it's not a problem. I told the story yesterday of a case that we had. It was a Saturday morning. It was about three years ago, and we had a very large obese Akita um, that had a pyometra. And my associate was going to do the surgery for the pyometra, but it also had a fractured carnasal or PM4 tooth, three-rooted. And so when it was being prepped for surgery, I took my air drill to open up the tooth and put some bleach in before doing a root canal because I wanted to sterilize the tooth. And I thought, well, it's asleep while it does, has a surgery, then it will sterilize. But with uh, bleach and root canals, you only need to leave it in there for 12 minutes. So I forgot how long it took to prep a big dog for a pyometra, so I kept working on the root canal. And I actually was able to finish the root canal before we did the pyometra but obviously we gave the correct antibiotics ahead of time. So if you use the right antibiotic, you can combine surgery and dentistry at the same time under the same anesthesia. Obviously, if there's bone infection, another indication. Uh, as I said earlier, if you have ulcers, little craters in the mouth, then that's also a strong indication for antibiotics. And with periodontal disease, if it's a chronic case, repeat, uh, then I would use antibiotics on that. Certainly when we get out to uh, the really severe cases, then antibiotics are indicated. We do a fair amount of stomatitis uh, treatment on FIV positive cases, or FI, po FIV positive cats, and with those, antibiotics are necessary. Uh, they do respond to treatment. Uh, the FIV positives do, they just take longer. Um, heart murmurs in humans, if you have a dental procedure, you definitely need antibiotics. Unfortunately, in the United States, they don't use combination antibiotic therapy if you have a heart murmur and you're going to get your teeth cleaned. And they will give you drugs for a gram-positive infection because the majority of heart valve infections in people are caused by gram-positive bacteria. The unfortunate thing that most dentists don't know in the U.S. is 15% of heart valve infections are caused by gram-negative or gram-negative anaerobic infections. So if you're a person and you're getting your teeth cleaned, whether you're in the U.S. or Italy, and you have a heart murmur, make heart murmur you want to make sure that you have proper coverage. It's not that often that you'll have heart valve infection after cleaning the teeth. But if it happens to your heart valve, that happens to be 100% of you. If we have uh, mucositis, which is red all throughout the mouth, obviously antibiotics. Uh, stomatitis, I always use. Again, that ulcer word comes up. Or if we have, again, localized severe uh, periodontitis, that's when we want to use antibiotics. We talked about this a uh, little bit earlier, that if you have periodontal disease and you have your teeth cleaned, uh, that greatly reduces the bacterial infection. It doesn't completely eliminate it, but it greatly reduces it for 60 to 90 days. And that's why people who have bad periodontal get their teeth cleaned every three months. And we had a, uh, a dental meeting in Mexico last December, and we had a very honest human periodontist from the University of Colorado. And what he said was, yes, if we used proper antibiotic therapy in people in the U.S., then periodontists wouldn't see their patients every three months. But unfortunately, Americans can be known for uh, loving the U.S. dollar, and specifically periodontists, and so they still don't make the switch to using antibiotics. They don't do what's best for their patients, which is really kind of sad. 
Many studies and people, again, will show that you can eliminate these bacteria for up to three years, and that greatly increases the health of the human patient. And we suspect similar findings when we find enough money to go out like the study with the question you asked, that we'll see that it'll help dogs and cats, too. The unfortunate thing about uh, dogs and cats, and especially cats, is they have some bad habits of licking places on their body where they have a lot of gram-negative anaerobes. In the U.S., we would call it the back of the bus, and so they may reinfect themselves. This is uh, how we culture. This would be a, a sterilized forceps. Uh, this is a paper point that we use in root canals. And we will put this down into the sulcus, and you can see actually this is a little bit wetted right there. All you need to do is put it in for 10 seconds. Then you'll place this into a little media jar, screw the lid on tight, send it on into the lab. But again, don't waste your money on animal labs in this country. You'll have the same problem, I'm sure, uh, as in uh, America. So you'd want to establish a relationship with a human dental school and send them in there. And fortunately, I'm able to get a discount, almost 50% uh, discount for cost when I send them to the human dental school because they think it's really interesting to do the work on dogs and cats. In humans, they have actual DNA probes, little test kits that you can use on humans, and it will show you if the bacteria are one of the six main problem bacteria in human mouths. Unfortunately, in dogs and cats, we don't know for sure which ones they are yet, and so therefore no DNA probes have been developed. But I'm sure that will come, so that you will be able to do a simple test right in your office. Eventually, it will show you which antibiotic to choose for dogs and for cats. The key on the bottom is, again, to try to normalize what's in the mouth. And I use the ear I steal from uh, Dr. Erke's lecture. The ear in a dog, for example, is a perfect example. If you have a mixed infection of yeast and, say, Staph aureus bacteria, if you just use, say, cephalexin or uh, enrofloxacin and you eliminate the staph, then the yeast will increase in number. And that ear will either not get better or it might actually get worse. And uh, at least for years, I used to treat dermatology cases wrong because we never looked for yeast. We'd get rid of the staph, and the skin just never got better because we'd increase the yeast. Same thing in the mouth, only we're not dealing so much with yeast. We want to keep the normal bacteria. One way to normalize it is to get rid of the bad bacteria, and it'll normalize. One way to make it worse is to use an antibiotic that kills all the gram positives. It's not too unlike sterilizing the intestinal tract with the wrong antibiotic and makes things worse. So our goal is to be uh, careful with what we use. The uh, bacteria exist in many places in the mouth. As you can see, obviously, the tongue. Uh, that's why now they have instruments to brush your tongue. I'm still not brave enough to uh, use those. Um, Fistulous tracts that we see in cases of stomatitis, and I'll show you some cases here in just a bit. And if you remember back to our little uh, anatomy slide, the horizontal dentinal tubules inside the tooth itself can house bacteria. And so if you're going to use a doxyrobe gel on the outside of the tooth, it's obvious you're not going to penetrate dentinal tubules, and it won't do you any good. So again, if you have the correct need for systemic antibiotics, then that is the way to go. And also, uh, the furcation areas of multi-rooted teeth, you need to have penetrability and systemics are the way to go. Uh, in the US, uh, tetracyclines are uncommonly used in uh, human dentistry. Uh, in fact, at the human dental lab at USC, <clears throat> they don't even test for tetracyclines. And there's a significant, significant amount of bacterial resistance to tetracyclines. Um, they do use a low dose, daily dosage of tetracycline in human periodontal cases in the US. 
not so much for the antibacterial properties, but the one nice thing about tetracyclines is the anti-collagenase properties. And that is why the doxyrobe gel, if indeed we don't have infection elsewhere in the mouth, works very well. Uh, the anti-collagen properties allows the tissue to heal. And I referred to a case yesterday of a Norwegian elk hound that had five deep pockets, meaning they were four millimeters or deeper. And I used the doxyrobe gel in all of those pockets after ultrasonic scaling. And there was actual tissue gain of up to three millimeters in each of those pockets. And if I told that story to a human periodontist, then he would think I was lying because people don't heal as well as dogs. In, in a person, they get excited if they get less than a millimeter of regrowth. But in all five of those pockets, we got close to three millimeters of, uh, of, of uh, tissue coming back in the gum. And when that happens, then the body has natural defenses because it's a friend of mine's dog, and I know that she won't brush her dog's teeth. So it was very significant in that case. Amoxicillin uh, and penicillin, we don't even have penicillin in our hospital. We haven't had it for probably 15 plus years. Um, we do see uh, resistance to amoxicillin, even in some of the gram negatives. Um, and there was a paper done uh, by a veterinarian in Australia that was published last year that shows problems with amoxicillin and problems with clavamox not getting all of the gram-negative anaerobes. And there was also a paper published two years ago in the European Human Periodontal Journal that showed the same problem with clavamox and amoxicillin with periodontal pathogens in people. Trimethoprim sulfa is another drug that we don't even have in our hospital anymore. I hadn't used it for years. Um, my best associate, who's far smarter than me, and uh, who is a lady, is a wonderful veterinarian. She used this particular drug in a German Shepherd, and uh, it blew its liver out, and the dog died. That was about three years ago, if I remember correctly. Um, and that's something you rarely see. But if it happens, and it happens to one of your best client's pets, it's a terrible thing to go through. So uh, Dr. Robertson doesn't use this anymore. Uh, we don't test for it in uh, dental cases at all. Azithromycin, I'm going to have to update this a bit. Um, I've been discussing this for about two years with the Pfizer company because it is an excellent antibiotic to use in the oral cavity. They had tested it and hoped to bring it out for dogs and cats, but they said they had a significant vomiting problem in both species. But Dr. Ford, when he talks this afternoon and just in discussion with him on this trip, he's actually using this in dogs and cats at a dosage of five milligrams per kilogram once a day for five days. If you, this particular drug, at least in humans, if you use it for five days, you actually get 10 days of coverage. He said he has used it as long as 10 days in severe infections in dogs and cats. So this is a drug that you may want to look into. Um, you can also use it IV. Uh, there, I know there's a liquid form of it, too. Uh, and then it's a tablet form. Uh, in the US, of course, it's like everything in the US. It's expensive, uh, but it may be a good drug to look at. Um, I've already trashed uh, Clavamox. And again, it kills too many of the good bacteria and does not get all of the bad bacteria. And we do a lot of uh, cat gingival stomatitis cases, and a number of cases are significantly worsened when they're on clavamox. Cephalexin, which uh, that, that should be an A instead of an E, it's a wonderful antibiotic for the skin. Uh, but again, we don't even test for it in the mouth because it doesn't do the coverage that we want. Clindamycin, very good against anaerobes, probably takes out too many gram positives. Uh, there are occasional ones, uh, actinomyces AA is a common one we see in dogs. And sometimes it does not take that, it, or does not eliminate that uh, bacteria. 
Uh, it's nice that it's once a day dosing, um, and we did do that study on about 35 dogs. Uh, we learned a lot about the mouth. Um, in this particular study in periodontal disease, it reduced or it increased clinical attachment, uh, meaning the gums grew back an average of 15%. Again, in human dentistry, they get really excited about that. To me, 15% doesn't excite me that much. This is another shot in Wyoming. Um, they've reintroduced wolves in Yellowstone National Park. And my little boy was about 10 years old, and he uh, calmly said, hey, Dad, there's a wolf track over here. And I, I didn't even know he knew there were wolves in, in that area. And I went over there, and sure enough, it was a wolf track. OK, metronidazole, if it had some more properties, it would probably be the perfect drug to use in the mouth. It's very cheap. The negative, it tastes like silver to people and dogs and cats. Um, the neat thing about it is it's only effective against gram-negative anaerobes, and that's really a good thing. Um, there are some just gram-negatives that aren't anaerobic that can cause periodontal disease that it doesn't cover. Uh, the neat thing is, though, when you combine it with enrofloxacin, uh, they're actually synergistic, meaning the one, one and one equals three, so it's a very powerful combination. And it has a tendency to kill less gram uh, positives. And uh, I kind of bounce around on my dosage on metronidazole, range at 7 to 10 milligrams per pound. If it works for you, it works for me. I've even gone as low as 1 milligram per pound of enrofloxacin because, again, they're synergistic and they work very well together. The other neat thing about this combination is we don't see diarrhea from any antibiotics. In fact, in Southern California, we have uh, Giardia in our drinking water. So when you turn on the faucet in Southern California, you're going to probably get some Giardia. In fact, we've done PCR testing on dogs in our practice. Virtually every dog that comes into our practice has Giardia. And it's very difficult to eliminate. Not all are clinical cases, but they're all harboring Giardia. And it's also true in people in Southern California. I drink bottled water. Um, so you don't get the um, diarrhea from this. And also, the once a day dosing is nice. If you uh, use Batril alone, and we have to tell this to all the uh, buyer people, it's probably not an antibiotic for the mouth. And so I don't want you to leave here thinking that you're going to use Batril by itself and do any good for periodontal disease. You won't. In fact, you would probably make the case worse. But when you combine it with metronidazole, that has been my drug of choice, those two together, for probably five to seven years. And since we continually do cultures, we kind of keep tabs on this. And there really hasn't been resistance. And it has the right coverage. And so it's, so far, it's standing the test of time. So you get the best of both worlds. Obviously, um, enrofloxacin, it penetrates granulomatous tissues better than any, an, any antibiotic that we've ever tested. And so the penetrabil uh, penetrability is excellent. The efficacy is excellent, and there's no resistance. So this is my best choice. In the US, um, we will go to a pharmacy, and they will compound liquid enrofloxacin and liquid metronidazole. And that works really well in cats, uh, not so well in dogs because the volume is too big. Uh, and typically, they don't mix the two liquids together. They're given separately. Um, and Bayer, by next year, supposedly, they will come out with a liquid uh, Batril. And that will be very helpful for uh, cats. These two together, obviously, it broadens the spectrum of activity. Uh, this is repetitive, and this is repetitive. But you kind of get the feel uh, that this is the way to go. The reason you can give it once a day, most of us know that Batril can be given once a day, uh, at least in the United States. And I'm sure you, uh, you folks are smarter than uh, us Americans. Uh, metronidazole is also a concentration-dependent antibiotic. 
And that means that if you give once a day, double the dose, you get a much better kill of the bacteria and less side effects. And as we said earlier, hopefully your clients, by giving the drug once a day, will actually have a greater compliance. They will actually give it to the dog or give it to the cat. I would say we probably have, at least in the cat stomatitis cases that I treat, at least 20% of my clients cheat. And I can almost always catch them. And we'll go into these cases and you'll understand why. Because if I eliminate the infection with laser, <coughs> excuse me, in the biofilms, and they don't give the antibiotics, they'll actually get worse. If they give the antibiotics, they get better. So I really stress to them that I am only half of the solution, and the laser is only half of the solution. The antibiotics are extremely important. But we still have at least 20% cheat. I bet no Italian clients cheat on their administration of drugs, right? Everything you prescribe, always, they always give it perfectly. You people are wonderful. Just, you just like your food is wonderful. No, OK. This is a uh, case. We don't see stomatitis that common in the dog. But when we see it, it's ugly. As you can see, this is actually hemorrhaging. Uh, this is a case that I was the seventh veterinarian. And I guess seven is the perfect number in the Bible, so this is a good thing. The bad thing was the husband and the wife were both attorneys. And I don't know how it is in Italy, but our worst clients are attorneys and medical doctors, because they know far more about everything than veterinarians ever could hope to. They make the worst clients. They probably give the drugs the least. But these people wanted answers. The referring veterinarian had done everything really quite well on this case. These people, even though they've been cheating, they were spraying in the mouth with chlorhexidine on a daily basis. But as you can see, without brushing, it wasn't doing the job. The other problem that this dog had was that it had been on clavamox. So when I get a case like this, and I bored you in the first hour with the basics of what I do, I always take full mouth x-rays, we always clean the teeth, we polish them, we periodontal chart them, and I can tell you that the only thing I did is got rid of the biofilm on this dog. And what happened, as you can see, the date here is March 16. And here it is, a little bit less than a month later. And I convinced the clients to brush the teeth. But in that prior slide, you can tell that if they brushed the teeth with that much hemorrhage, the dog probably wouldn't allow it. And there would have been blood everywhere. And uh, they probably would have uh, not been best friends anymore. But once we get rid of that infection, and usually with the antibiotic, within three days, it makes a dramatic response. Then they can start brushing the teeth. This was in 99, and they were very pleased. They thought I walked on water, but I didn't. I just used the right antibiotic. So essentially, I cleaned the teeth, put the case on the right antibiotic. The bad thing about this is as we go back to the human cases that last three years, I haven't seen this dog since. That's the bad part. Uh, this uh, she was a five-year-old greyhound. Again, we've covered through this. Uh, they still uh, hopefully are using the chlorhexidine, but again, if we can eliminate the gram-negative anaerobes, let the gram positives grow back, and then use maintenance therapy, we can take a terrible uh, infection with periodontal disease and mucositis, and uh, a lot of pain. I'm sure that dog had a lot of pain. Uh, we can make them feel a whole lot better. This is a uh, case, as you can see, that's a kissing ulcer, ulcer right there. And uh, before I started using the right antibiotics, I used to use laser. And I would vaporize that whole infection away, use the rank, wrong antibiotics, and they would come back. And I, of course, thought that laser was just this wonderful uh, tool that cured everything. But it doesn't work in kissing ulcers unless you use the right antibiotics. So then I graduated to using laser and the right antibiotics. And then I found out I didn't need the laser. So this is just with antibiotics alone and only eight days' worth. And there it is down the road. As you can see, it's uh, healed completely. Obviously, in a case like this, we want to follow them out to make sure that they do well. 
I don't know why they call these kissing ulcers other than the fact that this tissue kisses the tooth, but it's not like you want to be kissing your uh, wife or your husband if they had an ulcer like this. Maybe in France where they do French kissing, but they don't do that in Italy, right? No? No French kissing in Italy, okay. Whoops, we gotta go back to, I got excited there, talking about kissing. Um, this was a kitten that came to me in uh, 1998. This is the very first time I ever used laser on just a simple case like this. And this lady paid $400 uh, US for this kitten. The teeth look like this. And uh, typically in the US, there's a large viral cause of this. And I can assure you that if I clean the teeth, use the right antibiotics, it wouldn't get any better. In fact, I had uh, some Abyssinians that at least in the U.S. have uh, disease much worse than this. And one of the periodontists from USC lived close to my practice. I had him come in and do the ultrasonic scaling. There was blood everywhere. And yet in his own mind, he thought he was a hero. I had him come back and look at this cat two weeks later, and it was worse. And so I said, uh, heck with that. I'm going to use some laser and use the right antibiotics. And you can see I don't use cortisone on cats. And uh, this is what it looked like on uh, May 6th. And so here it is three weeks later. And nothing that I've ever done before has ever worked this well. It's the only thing that will do it. And we have some show cats that come in, or just uh, regular family cats that will have the uh, gingival red line in these cats that are actually they're still kittens under one year of age. And uh, those clients are concerned about that. And if I just, on those early ones, all I do is just vaporize a thin line and go right along where it would be red, and uh, that takes care of it. And most of those cases don't recur. But in cats, they're kind of strange. They don't respond to periodontal therapy like dogs do. Dogs are more like people, and cats are in a world of their own. This one, uh, the slides didn't uh, come through too well, but this is just a simple gingivitis here. And uh, you can see this would be uh, probably less than a month later. It went from the red line in, uh, to normal. I just play around with these sometimes, but they uh, do really well. This uh, is a severe case of stomatitis. And I was able to get some free publicity several years ago. I did a, a laser study for University of California at Irvine that now helps children. It was kind of a neat study, but I put in a little extra information that we were doing stomatitis cases with laser. I actually started doing these initially with electrocautery in 1984. And so I've had about 17 years of these cases, and we've done a few hundred of them. Uh, but this is a cat. Um, that the biofilms are unbelievable here. There are fistulous tracts. Uh, some of these cats will have lesions that are an inch long, half an inch wide, half an inch tall of just granulomatous tissue. And we all know that if we just gave antibiotics, it's not going to penetrate that. Even the wonderful Batril does not penetrate those masses. Uh, and in the mouth, if you don't use electrocautery or laser, and you try to cure the, curette that out like a, an abscess, on the skin in a cat, it's going to bleed so much, you can't see what you're doing. You're going to have to use suction, and you create all sorts of problems. So this is what the cat looked like when we were done uh, with therapy. It took several, uh, <coughs> several treatments. And as you can see, we still have teeth present, which is uncommon in stomatitis. And most veterinarians still in the US and some of the dental experts, they still recommend pulling all the teeth. From my perspective, I think that sounds a little dramatic, a little bit of overkill. And that's where human dentistry was in the world 100, 200 years ago for people. You had bad infection, just pull all their teeth. And the theory is that there's some response between the dentin and something in the body, so you have an autoimmune response. And as we all know, when we don't understand something, at least in veterinary medicine, we call it autoimmune disease, correct? It's a wonderful catch-all term for we don't know. And it's my personal feeling that these are just severe gram-negative bacterial infections. There's probably a small percentage of them that do have some strange, weird component. Maybe the white blood cells aren't uh, uh, working properly. Who knows? 
But uh, these cases, typically 90% of the time, we can clear them up, and they have a tendency not to recur if we get it completely eradicated, and uh, we actually save their teeth. This is another case in just a full mouth. You can see the uh, mucositis here, periodontal disease. Um, these cats also have a high number of resorptive lesions. And in the U.S., the last study that we saw, adult cats in the U.S., 68% of adult cats have resorptive lesions. So this is what he looked like. In fact, you want to go back, Paulo, and we'll just do the before and after. You can show them. Same cat. So that was less than a month later. And if you'll notice, kitty cat still has teeth. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.